home using gives a symmetry, then make a table of values, and then graph. So symmetry, here we go. So I think I already know the answer to this. We're going to replace theta with negative theta. I'm doing this because I know cosine is even. So R equals 1 minus cos negative theta cosine is even. So this is 1 minus cos regular theta. And this is theta with negative theta is x-axis. Hopefully, x-axis. There we go. Uh, you cannot have two symmetries. You either have no symmetry, one symmetry, or all three symmetries. Uh, we would fail on, let's see, y-axis. You can see you can see that by replacing theta by pi minus theta, and then do the difference formula, or difference, uh, difference for sine. And, uh, but anyways, you can't get all three. So we're gonna use x-axis to make our table. So x-axis, what that means is our unit circle. If we have x-axis symmetry, that means what happens on the top can be flipped over to get what's on the bottom. So our table of values is going to go from 0 over to pi. And then we're going to take those, the graph we get, and then use x-axis symmetry. Theta, 0, pi over, we'll just do them all, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2. Uh, what else? 2 pi over 3. 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 6, and 1 pi. Now we want uh, 1 minus cos theta. So we'll go with cos theta, and then 1 minus cos theta. And we're also going to use decimal approximations. So first one is 1, and then pi over 6 is square root 3 over 2, and pi over 4, 1 over square root 2, pi over 3, 1 half, so writing these in decimals, that's 0.5. We have to approximate these. One, of course, is one. That's easy. Ooh, square three of it out of, of two. 0.86, I hope. Nobody's here to tell me I'm wrong, so I must be right. And one over square root two, point seven one ish and we gotta do one minus all these. So one minus one is zero. One minus 0.86 is 0.14. One minus 0.71 is 0.29. One minus 0.5 is 0.5. Now you have to keep going down here. Of course you get zero. One minus zero is one. You keep going down and getting all these values. When you graph, you're gonna graph zero, zero, pi over six comma 0.14 uh, pi over four comma 0.29 etc 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 so you graph all these when you graph them make sure your polar graph paper I believe the biggest we're going to use is two so I really only need two circles so that's radius one and this will be radius two Oh, those are ugly circles. Here's our pi over 4. Here's our 3 pi over 4. Pi over 6. Whatever that one is. Pi over 3. I'm not super motivated to make this pretty because uh, I'm about to use a computer to graph it. Uh, you are not allowed to, but I'm not you, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, uh, oh, look at that. It's conveniently right there. I think this is wider than it is tall. The Just the scale's a little bit off, so it should be a little taller. I don't know exactly why that is the case. But anyways, this is our uh, cardioid shape right here. <clears throat> We're going to go back to... Calculus now. So we just did that whole, spent a whole lot of time uh, finding the uh, Cartesian slope. 
So let's look back at our shape. We better pick a good value to get a good slope. Now when I say a good value, uh, this point down here is not a good one. It's gonna be kind of boring. It's gonna be flat. Uh, let's go. Another bad value would be right here. Whatever t value gets you zero because uh, finding a that's actually a quarter point. It has a sharp uh, edge right there, and you're not gonna get a nice. You're not gonna get a single tangent value out. Um, you probably get a vertical tangent there. Let's go for whatever t value or whatever theta value gets us to that point right there. So it's very tempting to say this point is one zero in rectangular coordinates, and I can go ahead and write that down over here. One zero rectangular is, is that also one zero polar? I think it is one zero polar. Zero polar. So radius one, angle zero. Now, unfortunately, there could be lots of names for this point. So not only do we have one zero, what else could we use? Pi and negative one. Uh, there are some other names for it, but hopefully we'll be able to get it with one of these two names. So let's go ahead and finish our table for pi, and hopefully we'll get lucky down here. So cosine of pi is negative one, and over here we're doing one minus, minus one is two, uh-oh. So pi we're at two. Pi would, shouldn't be at two. That should be either, it should be three pi over two. Did I type it incorrectly? One minus sine theta. Oh, my goodness. Well, there's a mistake I made on purpose. Our original was one minus cos theta. Wow. All right, rookie mistake. Here we go. How about we use pi negative two and look at our vertical tangent right there. Uh, you know what, vertical tangents are bad, so we'll see that happen here uh, in Cartesian coordinates. Let's also go with uh, this right here, which should be hopefully pi over two. We'll use pi over two as one theta value, and then we'll use uh, pi as another. So we'll go oh, zero, zero, one, and negative two, zero. And I believe this one will probably, so zero, one, should be pi over two, comma one, hopefully. Yep, there's our, right there, pi over two. Our value is one, and when we use pi, we get two for our radius. So in rectangular coordinates minus two, zero, in polars is going to be pi, comma, two. All right, I want to find the Cartesian tangent lines at these points. We're in polar, so let's go with the uh, polar versions right here. So let's go with pi over two comma one first. Pi over two one, and we have this uh, dy dx right here. So let's write dy dx equals, it's going to be our slope of course. Hopefully this is the right one. I copied off my written notes, not the ones we corrected in class. All right, so they're correct. <clears throat> All 
All right, so we'll just go uh, with the pi over two comma one first. So first of all, what is f of theta? That is our r function, which is one minus cos. And if that's f theta, what is f prime of theta? Very easy to compute, zero uh, minus a negative sine, or just sine theta. Okay. So we're computing it, evaluated at theta equals pi over two. So again, this vertical bar that I just wrote is the evaluate at theta equals pi over two. So f prime of pi over two, sine pi over two times sine of theta, which is pi over two, plus f of theta, which is one minus cos pi over two times regular cos theta divided by f prime theta, so that'll be sine pi over two times cosine theta pi over two minus f of theta, one minus cos pi over two times sine pi over two. Okay, sine, some of the stuff will be zero. So what is zero? I believe every cos pi over two is gonna be zero. So I'm just gonna write, and I'll use some fancy technology with our blue marker. So write a bunch of zeros out. Zero, zero. That one won't matter, because it's already multiplied by zero. Cos, zero, all right. All the signs are one. Sine pi over two is one. So this is one squared plus zero divided by zero minus, we have to be a little extra careful here, one minus zero times one. A whole lot of ones and zeros, so it's one over negative one, which is negative one. So what is this? This is dy dx evaluated at that point. So this is our slope. Sometimes we really like to use the letter M for modulus. So our slope M is one. How in the world do we get uh, B? We're gonna use X and Y. What you don't wanna do, we have X and Y, those are obviously rectangular or Cartesian coordinates. What you don't wanna do is go and drop thetas and r's in there. So we said that was our polar point and somewhere our rectangular point was zero one. So all we do, plug in one for Y minus zero plus b, b equals one. There we go. So that one was not so bad once we got past the uh, derivative. That was probably the hardest part. <clears throat> and we could do the exact same thing for other, other point. And I encourage you very strongly to do that um, right after this. So go ahead, so you compute at, and in polars it was pi comma two. Tangent line equation, E equation. So you go to different M, different B most likely. All right, let's check our negative uh, X plus one, see if that actually works. Function. Negative X, 
What kind of keyboard doesn't have plus right on there? Oh my goodness, plus one, enter. All right. So there is our tangent line. Should look pretty convincing. Oh, my mouse is working, this is great. If you zoom way in, you see that it looks like the slope of the line is pretty close to the slope of the curve there. And if you keep zooming in, and keep zooming in. Now it's very close. We're also very zoomed in. We'll zoom in more, zoom in more. It's very, very close. And if I keep going, the further in I zoom, the closer it is. So I think at this point, you get the point. They are incredibly uh, close right here. So the closer you are to the actual point itself, the closer your tangent line is to the curve. Just to warn you, the other point I picked for you, oh man, oh there we go. You'll notice right here, I can guess the slope. The slope will be the same slope that a vertical line has. That is a very special type of slope and it's called undefined. What that means is you cannot write y equals mx plus b. Uh, so you won't be able to write it like this. Uh, you will get a vertical line equation. Uh, which is an incredibly simple equation. It's way more simple than the one I just crossed out. And go ahead and do that yourself. You could probably write the vertical line equation down. What I want you to do is use calculus to compute your slope in this way. Make sure you get the right slope, which like I said, should be undefined, which means that you're gonna be divided by zero. So that's the end, well, that's the end of 11.4. You will certainly graph again in polar coordinates, but that should be a review. So I never actually plotted the points and used symmetry on my graph, but that is what I expect you to do. So now we're gonna do uh, the next section, which is areas and lengths in polar coordinates. <clears throat> There's a lot to write out. Don't want this to go too long. Unfortunately, I don't know when I started it, so I'm just gonna have to estimate. Let's start out with uh, something easy that we know about. Circle, so if I say area of a circle, hopefully you say pi r squared. So why is that the area? because somebody told you so and you believe them. So let's figure out exactly why that is the area. So we're gonna assume uh, theta is two pi. And what are we gonna do next? Ah, so if you don't have a It is two pi. So if we want to get our area, now if theta is less than two pi, you have a part of a circle. I don't have that vocabulary word memorized. A sector seems like what it should be. Hopefully that's right. So if I have some angle here, this shaded area, let's say it's a sector. T O R, sector. Uh, and we're using uh, theta to measure it. Now, we just assumed on our circle uh, that we did the full area, theta was two pi. If your theta is not two pi, you need to see how much of two pi that you have. So if you're, for example, if your theta is just pi, 
you'll have pi over two pi, which is one half. You'll get half the total area. And whatever your theta is, you divide it by two pi, and that's the percentage or the proportion of the area that you're uh, considering. Now, let's go ahead, we can do some, one half, so our pi's will cancel. Let's do some simplification, pi pi, we get r squared theta over two, that's our area right here, or one half r squared theta, however you wanna write it. So this is, uh, so this is area of sector, if I could spell sector of uh, circle, radius r, our angle theta. So we are doing this so that we can, we're about to uh, look at approximating areas of curves using sectors. So let's redraw this, what the sector looks like, and I'm gonna draw it in not standard position. So let's say our sector is right here. We have R, the angle we're using is theta, so our area, one half r squared theta. It's gonna be very important because we're about to add up a whole lot of sectors to approximate area. Okay, so this should mostly have been review. Uh, we may not have, you may not have looked at areas of sectors before, but certainly area of a circle is review. So now we're still gonna look at area, area of a polar curve. So we'll draw a very simple polar curve in quadrant one. And let's say the curve just looks something like that. And I want to go from one angle to the next. So this is our polar curve. And if you can write it as r equals f of theta, that's the form you want it in. So how do we compute the area? I could shade in the area. That's, this is the area that we're interested in. How do we get that area? So we've been computing area before. Normally, we would have broken it up into pieces parallel with the xy axis and estimated area that way, um, adding up. Well, actually, we kind of stopped right here, added up what those individual areas would be. We're gonna do the same thing except we're gonna subdivide differently. We're gonna subdivide in a polar manner. So what does a polar subdivision look like? You're not parallel to any axis. You're gonna go with slices like this. And the other problem, this is almost a sector, except a sector would look like, I'll draw my best approximation of a sector. Something like that right there. So you're gonna have a little extra piece right here. That's why we're calling it approximation. So we have a little extra, depending on the way your curve goes or what, if you use the uh, first endpoint or if you use the second endpoint, you could have some area you're not gonna count. So this could be a smaller, an estimate that's smaller than the actual area. Or if the curve went the other way, I would actually, my estimate would actually be larger. But just like when we approximated with uh, tall rectangles, some of them were bigger, were taller than our, had a little more area than the actual area we wanted, and some had a little less. What we're going to do is take a limit 
So all this extra area is going to, whether it's positive or negative, is going to disappear. So there's our extra area, which is where we're using an approximation. So this is extra area, which is extra from our estimated arc, no, sector. Sector area. Okay, so let's start applying some variables here. So we're measuring in angles. So we'll say our initial angle here, our minimal angle, before we used A, we're going to go and use some Greek letters. So the Greek A is alpha. That's our initial angle. What is our final angle, our biggest angle? We called it B before, but we'll use beta now. And now measuring our sector. So our sector, this is the kth sector. So that means we are using RK. So our radius will be the, we'll write it as RK, and it is F of theta K. So that's F of theta K. How wide is this right here? What angle measures how uh, wide that is? We'll call it delta theta K. If you break them all into the same th thickness or the same, you subdivide the angle into the same size small angles, your, all these delta thetas will be the same. And if uh, we do need to measure, so where is just theta k? Probably should have, well, it doesn't matter which side we use. This right here, this angle will be theta k. And I think that is all that we need. Yep. All the measurements we need. Now we're about to use some geometry. So area of kth sector. We'll use a little k for that. Area of k kth sector. So we have our area formula we just wrote down somewhere, one half r squared theta. <clears throat> now we better get the right r and the right theta. All right, r squared, well r is f of, in our case this will be rk, and the width will be delta theta k. So rk is, f of theta k, we have to square that times uh, delta theta k. So that is a k, the area of the kth sector. Now the kth sector, our actual area, again is missing this little bit extra right here. So we're using a sector to approximate the actual area. So this little shaded, it's almost a triangle, uh, that shaded wedge is the extra. That's how far off we are from the actual area. But again, we're gonna take a limit and it's gonna turn into an integral. So we're gonna approximate the area with this. And we need to add up from, you can go from k equals zero to n minus one or k equals one to n, a k. So that's our, actually I said approximate, so I should write approximate. So these are squiggly equals like this. And I'm just gonna rewrite what AK is. One half F theta K squared delta theta K. 
Now area equals limb and approaches infinity summation k equals one to n one half f of theta k squared so we know the limit of an summation is an integral so this is integral we get a one half we can move that out front one half f of theta squared delta theta is d theta and we're going to go from theta equals alpha to theta equals beta that's a nice ring to it hopefully that's correct let's see that is what i have in my notes all right we'll do a problem here now we'll use obviously it'll be an area problem we'll use this formula find the area of the region enclosed by the cardioid I think there's one too many eyes in that word, but I can't read my handwriting. It's probably, oh well. Uh, the cardioid is two times one plus cos theta. So you will not have enough time to properly graph this out on a quiz. So how in the world do you figure out where theta should start and end? Uh, when in doubt, you can go 0 to 2 pi. Just to warn you, that will not always be correct. So we could graph it out. Uh, so we got foo plot already open. So we'll go ahead in here. And we have two, two, uh oh, plus two times, uh oh, what is W? It should have been a two. times, I don't want that function anymore. So one brief word about how these can look if, come on keyboard, there you are. <clears throat> that second number is bigger. So you go two and three. You get a loop. So if the coefficient of the trig function is larger, you actually get a loop. In which case, if I asked you for the area, I would probably need to specify, I would probably say between the outer loop and the inner loop. And that is a tougher question. So we'll do a similar problem coming up. You'd have to get the area of the outer loop and then the area of the inner loop, and you need to figure out where they intersect right here. The good news is on this one where they intersect, the radius is zero. So you want to find the theta values that make radius r equal zero. Again, this is not quite our problem. I just wanted to describe this. All right, so we should be able to go from zero so start here at zero and then go around to two pi and be okay. So we'll go zero to two pi on this one. Now 
And of course that's alpha and beta. So alpha zero, beta two pi, area equals integral zero, two pi, we do have a half. So f of theta is this uh, two plus two cos theta, <clears throat> or two times one plus cos theta. So we get two squared times a half is just two. Zero to two pi, one plus cos theta squared. So how do we integrate this? Unfortunately, this is not one plus cos squared. Uh, well, actually, it would need to be one minus cos squared before we could turn it into a sine squared. This is not like that, so I'm gonna FOIL it out. So easy antiderivative, easy antiderivative, not easy antiderivative. How do you integrate cos squared? So we call this the half angle, double angle, double angle formula. It's called the double angle formula. That's how you, how you can integrate this. All right, I'm not gonna keep going here. This is far enough. Uh, I'm gonna write dot, dot, dot. I do expect you to finish this antiderivative, but this antiderivative is a calculus one, maybe not even really a calculus two problem. So you should be able to knock this out pretty easily and be, there should be a book problem. So they, they'll have the answer in the book. Uh, Wolfram will also tell you if you're right or wrong. It's not gonna be a pretty area. So the numbers aren't gonna be very nice. So we'll talk about now area of a region between curves. Sorry, I haven't really had enough food to eat. I've been trying to make videos uh, pretty much since the second I woke up. That's the last one of the day. So I am most hungry right now. Okay, so we want to uh, find the area between two polar curves. We'll go R1 of theta will be curve one, and R2 of theta will be curve two. So we're gonna assume R1 is less than uh, R2 when theta, oh, we can use interval notation, is in the uh, interval, uh oh, we'll go listener or equal to uh, alpha, comma, beta. And you just saw how to turn an A into an alpha if you screw up. It's easier to turn a B into a beta too. Uh, you also have to make sure that your radiuses are not negative, your radii are not negative. And of course our actual radius will be in between R2 of theta. So I need to make sure my radius is never negative if I'm gonna use this version of the area between curves. So this looks confusing and hopefully an example will make it more clear. So I want to find area inside circle. Oh, that equation is really nice. R equals one, constant, easy. And inside circle and outside, R equals one minus cos theta. So we want inside, R equals one and outside, R equals one minus cos theta. 
So I want to know when is, so I want to be inside, so I want to be radius to be one or less, but I don't want to get too small, I want it to be no smaller than one minus cos theta. Oops, less than one. And also, I do not want it to be negative either. So we have an inequality. <coughs> it's okay for it to equal one. I just want it to be greater than one. Ooh, trig inequalities. We haven't really looked at these. So first of all, inequalities, we can handle this a double inequality. which means both of them need to be true. So let's do some algebra. Let's add cos theta and subtract one. That looks right. And over here we will subtract two, one. Okay, how to do these inequalities. So how did we do inequalities before? Uh, we basically graphed. So we're gonna graph here. Now, do you wanna graph on a unit circle or do you want to graph uh, cosine out on the x, y axis uh, using the input x? I already am looking at the input being theta, so I think we graph it out on the unit circle. So cosine theta is an x-coordinate here. So I need to know when is the x-coordinate of the unit circle less than or equal to one. Wait, that's always. All right, so that doesn't put any restriction on it. Um, cos theta is greater or equal to zero. Well, that's definitely not always. That will be the right half of the unit circle right here. So this is where cosine is zero or more. So where is a positive? It's positive on the right half. So I got negative pi over two. I'm measuring in, uh, writing the angles here, the theta values. So there's negative pi over two to positive pi over two. Now this may seem very abstract. I haven't graphed the actual functions out yet. If you have access to a graphing tool, which you won't on a quiz or a midterm or a final, uh, you can go ahead and use that. So you have one minus cos theta. One, oops, Q, I want one minus cos theta. And then I wanna add R equals one. So I want to be inside, oh, it's an oval now. I don't know if there's a way to fix, oh, there we go. Look at that. That looks circular. All right, inside the circle and outside the cardioid. So here's the cardioid. I would be inside the cardioid over here. I would be outside the cardioid over here. Oh, it looks like the Batman boomerang. Very cool. So we're, I don't want to say the right half because technically it's not quite a half because we're going to lose these little curves right there. So it looks almost like a moon, a crescent right here. Let's go with Batman boomerang. So I want this shape right here. That would really have only been able to be determined by looking at a graph or drawing the graph. You, oh man, this is not good. Oh, now it's all back. All right. So there's my weak attempt at the boomerang shape. All I really needed from this was the fact that uh, our angle was gonna go again from negative pi over two up to 
pi over 2. But I already knew that. I knew that because I carefully turned my inequality right here into inequalities I was able to solve. So theta is between negative pi over 2, positive pi over 2. You can absolutely use symmetry, but just to warn you, I don't think the symmetry would have been obvious if I didn't have access to a graphing utility. So because of that, I'm not going to use the symmetry that I wouldn't really be able to see if, if I didn't have a graphing utility. We might be able to see the uh, symmetry in the uh, integral after we have it set up. So there are, let's see. All right, so we know our theta values. <clears throat> so there are, there's basically a big and a small area. Without knowing what it looks like right here, uh, what we're going to do is subtract, basically. So we want inside circle and outside this other thing. So our area is going to be the outer area minus the inner. I wish I could spell this morning, inner area. All right. Inside the circle, Those are not good words to go with inside and outside. Ooh. So we'll go with big minus small. So what is the big area? So we want to be inside the circle. So circle area minus uh, cardioid area. So I wanted to be inside the circle, which meant the circle was the sort of outer or the big area, and I wanted to be outside the cardioid, so the cardioid was a small area. So our circle area, because I know what it's going to look like, I can draw the circle area, looks like this, minus a cardioid area, looks like that. Now there's really no way to get that, those particular shapes, um, without having graphing utility, but we don't actually need those. So let's write the uh, big area out. One half, negative pi over two to pi over two. Circle area R is one squared d theta minus one half integral negative pi over two to pi over two. Our radius for the cardioid is one minus cos theta squared d theta. So we have our circle minus cardioid. Now you could technically compute the circle area using geometry and skipping calculus altogether. And that's okay to do. I'm not going to do that here. We have the basically the same integral, same endpoints. Uh, there's a one half in front of both. So I'm going to combine them and foil and use a negative at the exact same time. Probably not a good move. You know what? I'll make it a little less bad. I want to apply the negative at the same time. All right, next step. One minus one is zero, that cancels, and two negatives make a positive. Two 
cos theta minus cos squared theta d theta. Now I'm going to have you finish this problem. Again, uh, two cos theta is easy. Antiderivative is very easy. Cos squared, I think we just did a cos squared. Antiderivative, yep. Cos squared is one half, one plus cos two theta. So do the uh, half angle identity right here. Dot, 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 finish it off. Your book has the answer. And Wolfram, at this point, Wolfram can tell you the answer as well. To check, not to get, but again, to check. So today, uh, this is a class on YouTube, and we will have our quiz in class tomorrow on Friday. So make sure you make the class. I think the weather should be sunny and decent today. So tomorrow's weather it should be easy to drive in.